Um, it's a lot of work. We have so much fun doing it, and uh, we can't do it without you. So thank you. And I'm really tired. So uh, it was it was it was always tough to uh, put the last slot of any conference, and so I'm sorry. Like I'm just sorry because uh, we want we want everybody we want everybody. I apologize too. <laughs> <laughs> there was there was like a really competitive rock paper scissors and some wrestling that happened, and we all lost big time. Um, but no, we thank you, Amanda, for being here. Uh, Amanda Berlin's our our final speaker in this track. She's an information security architect for Hurricane Labs. They do cool IPv6 stuff, if you don't know. Nope, that's Hurricane Electric. Oh, it is. I apologize. I just had a Different fail. than Hurricane Labs. Yeah, you're right. Um, she has spent over a decade in different areas of technologies and sectors providing infrastructure, support, triage, and design. While working with the healthcare sector, Amanda has been involved in creating a secure method of uh, PCI and uh, HIPAA compliance and building comprehensive phishing and Awards Best User Education Program. Amanda is an avid volunteer and has presented in a large number of conventions, meetings, and industry events. Some examples of these are DerbyCon, Circle City Con, GERCon, and DEF Con. She is currently working on co-authoring a Blue Team Best Practices book, as well as part of a team on an open source phishing and user education software package. While she does not have the credentials or notoriety that <laughs> others might have, she does make up for it with her wit, sense of humor, and uh, knack for catching on to new technologies, and she makes a fantastic job of the hut. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I was actually going to wear the costume on stage but I'm not sure I could have dealt with the heat for that long <laughs> again. Um, and I, I refuse to put the video of it up here too, but it's on Twitter, I'm pretty sure. Okay, that works. Yeah, 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 we could totally do that. Um, so the talk is called Where to Start When Your Environment's Fucked. Um, I got the idea after countless times of walking into a new organization and everything just being screwed. There was no patch management, Windows XP everywhere. They, you know, I walked in, I walked into a place and had a new job at one point and, uh, a week after they realized that they had been, uh, breached and they had no clue what, it, what to do. Like they, just were kind of sitting there thinking, I don't know, maybe we could check the server. I'll start there, I don't know. <laughs> so helping a little bit with that um, is where I kind of got the idea for this talk. It started out as a blog post and then kind of rolled from there. Uh, my One of my bucket list items is to write a book. So this is going to be a very fast overview of some of the things that are in the book, kind of like a laundry list of what you want to look for in a company, either that you're in or that you plan on going into, um, that just has even, even a very infantile security program or one that um, just maybe isn't doesn't exist or, or you need to start working on. So that's, that's me. Has anybody seen the... Uh, the videos of the guys trying to eat crackers and stuff with these things in their mouth, you really need to look it up. It's hysterical. I, so I got a bunch of these and gave them to my children. I have three boys. They're running around the house drooling all over the place. Um, so this is me online, Info Sister. Um, my slides are up on my blog, too, if you want them afterwards with all the notes and everything. <clears throat> I worked in the healthcare uh, industry doing a range of different uh, defensive security things for about seven years. I never realized uh, the infosec industry was a thing until about two years ago. <laughs> um, you know, I grew up thinking, oh, I would, I, I would be, you know, so happy if I could be a white hat hacker. But I didn't realize that there, there were lots of them already, uh, and it was a whole like sub genre of people. So I started speaking two, two years ago, um, was way more nervous then than I am now. <laughs> and uh, a common theme that I noticed when going to conferences and watching talks was that 
most of everything were uh, offensive talks. So, you know, this new O-Day's out, or I wrote this new tool, or this is how we hacked in. And there was a serious lack of, okay, well, then what? Like, I, that's great. I'm not, I don't do anything offensive. It's great to be able to learn that kind of stuff, but the fact that you guys are all out there doing that, what am I supposed to do to fix all of the things that you're talking about? Which made, <laughs> which made me really happy um, about Ben 10's talk, because that's, that was his whole premise of his talk, right? He, he kind of showed you the red team perspective and then what you're supposed to do afterwards to either detect or fix it. I think that's a, a serious lacking in our industry and not just in InfoSec, but as far as like sysadmins go, um, you know, across the entire industry, no matter if you're in healthcare or ISPs. I mean, I know healthcare is getting better, but as an industry kind of sucks when it comes to security. Uh, same thing with education which I also was a part of for a very short amount of time. Um, so that's the, that's the whole premise. I'm just going to try and get through it as fast as I can. So there's my book title. I'm co-authoring it with uh, Lee Brotherston out of Canada. Uh, so Defensive Security Handbook, and I always forget the bottom part of the title, Best Practices for Securing Infrastructure. I kind of just came up with that part the other day. It should be out around next March. And that's a Malayan porcupine, I think, which is, is good for a defensive animal. Is that land porcupine? Mal Malayan. Most porcupines are land porcupines. There might be a sea porcupine. <laughs> these, are, these are the tree porcupines that fall on you. You know, it's a, this is a drop bear. <laughs> uh, so the TLDR of this quote is fix your shit because it's going to be hacked by script kitties if you don't. Um, many attacks on internet and network systems have no particular target. It's people scanning the internet. The attacker simply sends a large broadcast that uses any unprotected system as a staging point from which to launch an attack. Using computers without basic protections like firewalls, antivirus software, and user education not only affects your own business, but many other businesses as, virus, as the virus is spread around the internet. Your system's lack of protection makes you a target. It can destroy your computer, your network, and contrib can contribute to a virus distribution that slows or halts portions of the internet. All of us who use the internet have a responsibility to help create a culture of security that will enhance consumer and business confidence. But most importantly, failing to heed best practice advice could hurt your company significantly. And that's from the Internet Security Alliance Guide. I love, love that quote, but I didn't want to force you guys all to read it, so I gave you a nice little gif instead. Um, it's so true. Uh, there, there was no book on best practice, holy shit, where do I start? Um, so many offensive books out there, so many, you know, uh, things that you could do if you want to become a pen tester, but what do we give to the sysadmins that don't have money for training or don't, um, you know, have uh, the backing of their C-level executives? Matches, Matches and gasoline work uh, and, and knowing how to update your resume. <laughs> so when you go into a company, you have to realize... Uh, or if you're already there, I guess, uh, that upper management is going to need to be your BFF. You need to be able to talk to them and have intelligent conversations without scaring them of the Chinese hackers coming in and trying to attack you. You have to create a plan with them on where you're going to go. Maybe you don't have the budget. A lot of people have issues with upper, upper level uh, management buy-in. I think a good majority of that is because you can walk in and say, oh, it's going to cost a couple million dollars to secure our infrastructure when you haven't put any due diligence in yet to do any of the uh, required things that are out there that can be free and easy for you to do. So this talk is going to focus on three different things, the free and the easy, which there's a shit ton of stuff that you can do out there that you, might, you may or may not already be doing. There's the free and not completely easy. 
And then there's, you know, show me the money. Let's go buy some big blinky boxes. So starting early, um, you can do this before you even work for a company, which I, in hindsight, probably should have before I went and worked for education. Uh, I walked into the place and they had like three slash 17s and a couple slash 15s um, of public addressing. And you could access any of it. It was all online. Um, you know, you could get to their printers from the internet. You could get to their SQL databases and everything. Everything was just online. You know, they had a firewall, but it was open <laughs> to everything because then it just worked. So you can actually, this is a cool website that uh, we found the other day that will walk you through a, a bunch of different things that you could do for OSINT when it comes to the, either the company that you're looking to work for or one that you already have because you need to know what's out there and what other people can find. This is Recon NG. This will kind of give you a good list of the people's uh, email addresses that are out there on the internet that, you know, the bad guys are going to try and attack because these are the email addresses that are the easiest to find for your domain. It scrapes LinkedIn, it scrapes Facebook, it scrapes a whole bunch of different options you can set in there and kind of gives you an idea. It's very good stuff. Shows all the little domains. It uses the same uh, command structure as Metasploit. Um, a popular uh, GUI type tool comparative to this is Maltigo. Uh, Maltigo's good stuff also. Uh, but this is free and open source and will kind of give you the same type of information. Maltigo does have a free version, but they also have the expensive paid for version. Right. Um, there's the harvester that scrapes email addresses too. It's just a simple Python script. There's so much free and easy you can do. That That's how much free and easy stuff there is out there. <laughs> Who else thinks whoever pushed that little kid is just a dick? <laughs> right. So uh, getting a trial vulnerability scanner, your company might not give you the budget to pay for a vulnerability scanner yet. Show them what the tool can do. Let them, obviously, let them, don't quit breaking shit. Let them know uh, that you're doing it, of course. And, uh, you know, give them a sample report. Say, this is how screwed up we are. We need to actually do something with this. It's going to kind of give them an idea of where, you know, your baseline is when you start. Uh, breast, uh, breast pack, <laughs> uh, best practice GPOs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, NIST has some. Um, there's a there's a lot of best practice GPOs out there that you can start with that are already secured, and you don't have to individually go through every setting in your whole entire uh, GPO and figure out what's best set. So there are a lot of very good templates out there that you can use. Um, as few as possible domain admins. How many of you have, you know, more than two or three domain admins on your Windows network? Right? <laughs> uh, for the most part, depending on company size, you should only have people that are domain admins that are Microsoft certified and know how much can be fucked up from being a domain admin. We had once at the, uh, at the hospital, uh, somehow a vendor got domain admin just because we felt like they needed it. And, yeah, and uh, um, promoted an application server to a DC. Because why not? Uh, <laughs> you do it in fraud. 
So get rid of your domain admins. A lot of people also just give domain admin because they don't know what their software does, what permissions it needs. They just need it to work. And using domain admin to install or run a service works and is a horrible practice that nobody should be doing, but everybody is. Uh, get rid of open shares. It's an awesome Nmap script that will find all the open shares on your network for you. Yep. Sorry. <laughs> Ready? Nmap dash T4 dash V dash O. No, sorry. <laughs> Pro tip, don't read your slides. Uh, disabling Telnet or alerting on its use. A lot of legacy devices you can't disable Telnet on. There's some like Cisco 3548, Cisco whatever that you can't disable Telnet on because it's not even possible. And you might not even be able to replace that kind of stuff. But being able to alert on the fact that somebody did Telnet into it when they aren't supposed to, or replacing those devices when possible. <clears throat> Locking down logins over HTTPS. Um, I had the benefit of being able to be in the uh, DEF CON social engineering CTF, which was the most embarrassing experience of my entire life. Uh, they give you a company, and in this case, I had Frontier Communications. Uh, the beginning part's great. They give you all these questions that you should answer that are all OSINT related, like what's who's their trash pickup guy, you know, what what VPN do they use, that kind of stuff that you can actually go out there and find. And then the second part of it is you on stage in this glass box actually calling the company and trying to wish them for information. And it, I had never watched the competition before. I had never uh, vished at all. I had, I actually went after the winner. <laughs> so she knocked it out of the park, got every single question, points just racked up. I walked up there, she had clipboard, you know, all all these things written out and just planned to the T and shit, I have my phone. <laughs> so I I completely embarrassed myself. But this was one of the websites I was able to find. Uh, anybody can get it get to this and maybe it had a default credentials already there. Uh, but you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't log in to that kind of stuff that's on the internet. That's not yours. Not storing plain text passwords. Uh, I've known so many people to do this too. We had our entire, uh, all of our application, all of our SA passwords, everything in a uh, Excel document, but it was password protected, so we're fine, right? The password was capital info, <laughs> which happened to be the same password as our domain admin account. <laughs> Uh, no open Wi-Fi. And also have your Wi-Fi separated from your local network. The best thing, the best thing is having your open Wi-Fi on that gets DHCP from your, from your, uh, DC. Yeah, so you would be able to not only access the DC from, uh, the, the guest Wi-Fi, but you could actually get it from the internet, uh, get to the DC from the internet as well. Uh, no shutting ports that are unused and setting up port security. That way you don't have somebody just plug into an open port and boom, you're on VLAN 1 where everything else is because nobody likes to do network segmentation, nobody likes to use VLANs, um, you know, flat networks every, everywhere. So you want to shut off ports that are un un unused as well as not being able to unplug a port and plug in another device. Because, all right, so there's an unmanned public computer or somebody's desk computer that they left for the day. Um, I mean, we've, we've heard about how social engineering works. You just kind of act like you belong. You sit down and you plug in your stuff to the, to the port that they were using. Port security will fix that by automatically shutting off the port when it sees a new MAC address. Disabling SSL because 33% of HTTPS servers out there are vulnerable. To what? Heartbleed, Drown, Poodle, Freak, all the other SSL vulnerabilities that have come out with a nice little logo over the last couple of years. <clears throat> this website will tell you 
if yours is vulnerable. And this will show you how to fix it on whatever, Apache, IIS, all the different websites out there that would run SSL. Setting up centralized logins. Tacix is free. There's a bunch of different types of radius uh, packages that you can use that are free. Because if you don't set up a centralized login, chances are you're using shared passwords. BitLocker slash encryption on all of your end devices. Especially in healthcare, especially in the financial industry, anywhere that you're going to have sensitive data on an endpoint, why would you risk that big of a breach if, if somebody happened to have patient records or somebody happened to have PII on, on their desktop for some reason? Because, you know, they're not going to listen always. No, they're not supposed to have it on their desktop, but it happens. This kind of ensures that you don't really have to worry about it. Network device backups. Um, Rancid is a good one. Rancid's free. That will back up at least Cisco devices. Patching your Linux boxes because nobody remembers that who has, I mean, a lot, most people don't have a Linux admin on staff. Uh, we had, we had application analysts that would buy software that ran on a back-end Linux that had Linux is the scary boogeyman to the people that just come from a Windows environment that they don't want to touch because it's just a black box of text. Somebody needs to be updating it. <clears throat> and always regen your SSH keys from default. There are um, mostly man-in-the-middle man attacks that this applies to and is commonly bypassed. Uh, forgetting to actually regen them. Right. So status, removing all of your protection and redirecting to a malicious website. So remove your unneeded software. Chances are most of the applications do not need Java to run. Maybe it got added on as an, you know, an additional download. Yes, sir. There are a lot of different things for finding unneeded software <laughs> in your environment. Uh, the vulnerability scanners will find it, or at least the outdated versions. I believe Eminentware is a good one that we've used, uh, that I've used in the past, that will not only find where the, the software is, but will also update it for you and remove it. Uh, Secunia is a good one as well. A lot of people browse from servers. It's a bad idea to browse from servers. Uh, turning that off and even dis disabling them to be able to browse from servers is a step. You don't need to download anything. No updates. We just forget about, no. No watching porn from servers, which has happened as well. Uh, DNS and DCs are just that. Don't install anything else on your DCs unless it's forwarding logs somewhere because you need that log information. We had a our external website was facing the internet on a web server was dual home, so it was plugged into a public IP, plugged into a private IP. Its back end database server was running SQL that was on our DC, the same DC that was giving out DHCP addresses to the guest wireless. Full full circle. Just come in through the internet, out through the DC, out the guest network. You just keep going around in circles. <laughs> and then the Minecraft server. No, it didn't. Uh, logging, successful logins, I'm running out of time, uh, and searching for ILO settings and default passwords, which Metasploit has a script to do. <laughs> ILO 
<laughs> DNS zone transfers uh, will pre uh, pre preventing DNS zone transfers so you don't get um, DNS spoof attacks. Having uh, open recursive DNS server because you want to only be able to be re uh, resolve your own DNS names. Open mail relay because you don't want your exchange server on the internet being able to send email for anybody or from anybody. Uh, forcing advanced auditing, which is cool. Can anybody tell when the ransomware happened? No, it's right there, where where the green goes up. <laughs> the data girls, I know. <laughs> you could make a better visualization, I know, but this is ransomware is a huge topic right now. That should be able to be detected. Yeah, all right. Yay, Bitcoin. This is a free piece of software. Love this software. It's called NetDisco. It will crawl your network and let you know what's hanging off each port, what its MAC address is, how long it's been there, the SNMP, and mm -hmm. yep, it'll just SNMP walk your your uh, environment, give you all your different nodes. Awesome. <laughs> you know what? I can't fit everything into this talk, front row. <laughs> don't forget your printers because you don't want Nazi spam being printed to it. Or maybe you do, if you do leave my talk. Yeah, stealing printer certs is yeah, not good. A lot of people will accidentally log into a printer and leave the creds there. So software. Uh, all of these are free software. Uh, URL scan does a whole bunch of different things. Uh, you can set it so it will only resolve a max uh, byte size of URLs. You can remove your server header. Uh, it's only uh, for Microsoft IIS. Fail to ban and mod security are both for Linux. Ah, oh, crap. Ignore that. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, password management, we already went over. And Microsoft Baseline Security Analyzer is a free tool from Microsoft that can baseline the, uh, your Windows servers. So having an IR bug out bag for when you freak out, say you have a massive uh, virus outbreak or your server room catches on fire something, having uh, a bunch of tools in one place, so you don't have to worry. So boot to all the things, like Kali, uh, Security Onion, uh, I think Remix is a reverse uh, malware engineering Linux di distribution. Um, Cuckoo, Selks, Ubuntu, having a bunch of things on a USB drive that you can actually do IR with. Base images. A laptop not on your domain, because if your domain controllers get screwed up, you're, you're going to need something that is not connected. So you don't have to worry about that right away. Shitloads of storage for memory dumps, for anything that you would need it for, because that's the one thing you don't want to do is run out of storage. Yes, sir, in the back. No, but the data girl can't. No. <laughs> Yoda bytes. Yoda bytes of storage. Yoda bytes. No, just you know, handful of handful of terabyte SSDs. Um, well, I guess depending on your environment size, but <laughs> you guys are really distracting. <laughs> uh, Cables, bridges, power, so you don't have to worry about your enterprise environment or running out of power. Some MiFi's, so maybe your internet connection's down. 
a network app so you, you can figure out if it is an active attack, what they're actually doing. You don't want to stop them because they're just going to pivot and do something else anyways. You want to watch them so you know exactly where the problem is and exactly how to stop it. <sighs> Raspies for various things. This is a great IR bot book. Uh, after reading this kind of gave me the idea for uh, my book as well. This is all based on IR. Policies, procedures, a whole bunch of different tactics. Having an IR playbook for different risk scenarios that might happen in your organization. Ones that you've been over before. And the Incident Handler's Handbook. In, uh, on SANS, I have a link in the uh, in the notes that's very very helpful. It has like OS uh, OS template commands that you can run, uh, and incident handlers checklist for different things to go over, so you don't forget. It's just a short PDF. It's like 20 pages, something like that. And then we get to the free and not completely easy. <laughs> if anybody wants to tag Ian Amit on Twitter. <laughs> With this slide, this is what he looks like when he presents. Uh, so starting to purple team. Purple teams become, become a big thing uh, over the last couple years. Actually doing red team things in your organization. You don't have to necessarily be a super elite red teamer, but being able to know what others are doing, at least at the base level, is great for any defensive person. User education a topic that I'm very, very passionate about. I implemented a user education program at the, uh, at the hospital that I had worked at. All rewards-based. We actually would fish them for credentials, redirect them to a user education page. Anytime that they would report, we would give them, you know, drop their name in a little fishbowl, and they would be entered in for a prize. Worked great. Our reporting went up. Our fishes went down. We had, we had a, uh, I think it was three or six minute report on an active live pen test from a third party that we had paid. Your users are your first line of defense. They may catch everything before any blinky box or a log alerting can do. Having differing local admin passwords, so that way if somebody gets one, they don't have all of them. Especially you don't want the, the local admin for, you know, Susie's box in HR to be the same one as your local admin for all your application servers. Setting up least privileges as a general concept. Application whitelisting. And I have to go faster, I'm sorry. ERIS <laughs> e filtering uh, for all outbound traffic. You don't want everybody to be able to set up an FTP server and, you know, wherever they want. Doing a canary in the coal mine. Watch Ben 10's talk for more information about that. And for fuck's sake, asset management. Nobody can do this correctly. That's what I, that's what I look like every time somebody tells me they have no idea what's on their network. How are you supposed to protect what you have no idea you have? So some of the best practices when it comes to asset management. Have somebody take charge and be in charge. One source of truth for your assets. So many times I'll walk into a place and like, well, we kind of know that some things are in DNS and some things are in the spreadsheet and some things are in our IP address management. And no, you need one major list so you have one source of truth that you can find out what's actually on your network and constant, and you need to update it. You can't just, you can't be complacent when it comes to asset management. Having visibility into the network. Setting up some kind of automation so you're not having to deal with spreadsheets and do it by hand. And don't forget your cloud. It should be your goal to have as few things on your network show up on Shodan as humanly possible. If you're so, be quiet. <laughs> There's a free Shodan book out there. Well, not free, shit. Sorry. It's like five bucks. It's a great book from uh, John Matherly. You can find what your public de uh, facing devices are actually showing to be running. 
and some different things you can do with purple teaming. You don't have to be super elite. Uh, ben already talked about the first one, so go watch his talk. And map and mass scan, you can use that for uh, asset management. But you can also break a lot of shit with mass scan, so be careful. I know that firsthand. <laughs> Metasploit, there's great books out there and great resources, and they have a wonderful community. Learn how to use it if you're going to start uh, purple teaming. RAR is a cool tool that will actually just scan your network and show you images of all the web pages that it finds. Yeah, uh, Set is what I use to do the, the, uh, the phishing and capturing of credentials. And has a bunch of other things in it. And these two links right here fix everything that they say. <laughs> Worry about secure compliance. So if you follow compliance to a T, you can not be secure, right? I don't care what kind of compliance you need to adhere to. You can either be a checkbox checker or you can do the defensive security correctly when it comes to being able to still check mark the checkboxes. Compliance is great. <laughs> Compliance is needed across the industry, but there's definitely ways to do it wrong. So segmentation. Oh, shit. I couldn't find a... Uh, a good Kim Jong Un <laughs> picture for this, so that's that's the idea behind DMZ. Uh, being able to separate your your DMZ, so that website that was dual homed on the network should have been on a DMZ, so you can restrict the ports in between that and your local network. And finally, showing me the money. It's one of my favorite shows. Breaking Bad, if you haven't seen it, you need to. So after you've done your due diligence, after you've, you've locked down everything that you can possibly lock down, you should have a budget, right? You should be able to say, we've done everything humanly possible, but this is how we can get that next step better. You can get a real vulnerability scanner. So instead of just using the trial, you can, you know, vulnerability scan every week. Full scope, right? You don't want uh, to, uh, I guess, to uh, uh, touch on that a little bit. There are things that you shouldn't vulnerability scan if you break them massively the first time and it causes a lot of problems in your organization, like taking down all the phones. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of software out there that vulnerability scans or even port scans will just completely screw up. The fact that you know that can also go into your long-term plan. Uh, a SIM, IDS, IPS set up correctly that you do something with that you listen to. Set up some use cases. Know what your risk is. You don't want to just plug in a SIM or IDS, IPS and say, oh, well, we got one. It's, sure, we're, we're totally using it. So many people will just either buy it or, or try and implement it and just leave it and not listen to it. Either it's too noisy, it's not, it's not ingesting the correct logs, it's not looking for the correct things, it's not sitting on the right portion of the network, whatever it may be. Having a prof professional pen test and not a vulnerability assessment, because we all know lots of people sell pen tests, but actually just give you a vulnerability scan and say it's that. Implementing two-factor auth correctly. There are ways that you can implement two-factor auth that technically are two-factor auth, but you can still bypass it. Uh, not calling out a vendor name, but there's a way that you can set it up that it will call you. Okay, so user gets their pa username and password popped, which is easy because passwords suck. All right, so they log in with their username and password. Oh, we have two-factor auth. That's great. You know, we're wait, we're waiting for the two-factor auth to go through. All it does is call the user, and they're so ingrained and used to it, they're just going to answer the phone. All they do with this particular one, anyways, they answer the phone and hit pound like they always do before. It's kind of weird that they're not logging in anything, but maybe it's something in the background. That one gets bypassed constantly. 
So actually having a physical pin, that kind of thing, is way better. A physical pin, like the pin. And then the advanced buzzword devices. Um, getting organized, so IP address management, password safes. Uh, table, uh, incident response tabletops and drills are always fun. You never know how the other people are going to react. Worked with a company the other day. We did a tabletop. Oh, two weeks later, they had the exact same thing happen that we uh, did in the tabletop happen to them in real life. And they still screwed it up. <laughs> but you know what? It was They were way further ahead than they would have been otherwise. They knew who to contact. They knew who needed to make the decisions. They might not have handled it correctly, but they knew where those down, those uh, downfalls were, and they were able to to work past that. So being a, doing doing that kind of stuff on a regular basis is very, is really going to help. This is from a <laughs> this is a quote from a. Uh, uh, I think it's called attack-driven defense that I just really, really like. Um, yes. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. It's Zach. It's, he's not from Etsy. Yeah. Uh, you're never going to be 100% secure, compliant, whatever. You just have to plan for it. <laughs> Questions? <laughs> <laughs> I figured if I totally I figured if I totally fucked up the talk this would at least help. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, uh place online for my slide deck. It's going to be on slideshare.net. Okay? Um if you go to my, my gifts are on there also. If you need them, I can send you links to them. No, my uh, infosister.blogspot.com. There's a, a listing like downloads to my stuff. It's just links in there that'll take you to my slide share. Because my slide share name's really weird. When working with Orion, do you get to choose the animal? If so, why did you not choose the ball? Okay, so when we're <laughs> when working with O'Reilly, uh, no, I could not. Well, I could pick the animal. I I don't know if this is the right audience to say what I wanted. I wanted the little, I guess. All right, so I wanted the little fish that in, that lives in the Amazon that can swim up a dick hole and get attached. <laughs> Thank you. I can't do. <laughs> Uh, they said no. Uh, I also wanted a narwhal, but that was already taken. And working with O'Reilly's great. They're a great publisher. A can do? Kandiru. There we go. Maybe. I sent them a sketch of the dick, too. Yeah. Any Anybody else? Yes, sir? All of them do. At least now they do. So my, it's like video games. You have to pay for the extra. You can pre-buy the book soon. As soon as we get a uh, pre-release sponsor, the intro, chapter one, and chapter two are already done. Those should be out soon. What's a to Cedar Point or? Oh, to the book. <laughs> I don't know. That's the only season pass I have. Did it? What was it? How much it cost? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure what it costs. They haven't told me yet. It's like 30 ish, maybe. I don't know. It's supposed to be uh, 20 chapters. It's way more in depth than the talk, obviously. But... All good? Yay! Thank you, guys.